This episode is brought to you by AudioQuest, makers of the mythical series Analog Interconnects. Click the link in the show notes for more information. If you watch my videos purely for buying advice, then I think you're going to find that this video comes up a little bit short. However, if you understand that what I do is entertainment mixed with a little bit of buying advice and hi-fi chatter, then I think you're really going to dig what we're talking about today. And that is a new amplifier from NAD called the C3050LE. And we're going to be doing a fairly extensive side-by-side -side comparison between it and the model from the 70s, the NAD amplifier from the 70s, that inspired the C3050LE's aesthetic design or its look and its feel. Now we've made a preview video about the C3050LE before in which I called it Vintage Futurefy. It's a 50th anniversary model and from here on in I'm just going to call it the 3050. It's a class D amplifier. It uses Hypex's UCD modules. If you're a bit of a class D nerd that will be of interest to you. And also it makes use of NAD's hybrid digital amplification technology. If you want to know more about that, I have an interview with NAD's product manager linked in the description box below. However, I guess really the meat and potatoes of the amplifier drive here is that the C3050LE, I said I wouldn't say that again, but I did. The amplifier drive of the 3050 is 100 watts per channel into 8 ohms and into 4 ohms, so it's load invariant. The 3050 is made in China. And in Germany, it sells for 2,499 euros, which is quite a bit more than its stateside price, which is, I think, 1,972 US dollars. 1,972 refers to 1972, the year in which NAD was founded. Now, the amplifier that inspired the 3050s design is called the 3030. It was, I think, first introduced in 1978. And that second 30 refers to its 30 watts per channel into 8 ohms. And this is a class AB amplifier, not class D, because class D wasn't around in the late 70s. If you want to know what all this class AB and class D stuff is all about, I did write a brief article about it a couple of years ago on my website. Again, that will be linked in the description box below. Now, I did a little bit of internet digging on the 3030, and I discovered that in Germany, when it first went on sale, it sold for 398 Deutschmarks, because obviously this preceded the Euro. But in modern money, including inflation, so factoring in inflation, the 3030, if it were to sell today, would probably sell for roughly 600 euros. That's all other things being equal, which they never are. But that gives you some idea of the sort of the relative price point. So really, the, the new amplifier is much more expensive than the old amplifier, even when adjusted for inflation. And for you vintage amplifier nerds out there, yes, the 3030 that NAD sent me so the vintage amp, has been fully recapped. Now, because it's a Class AB amplifier, I expected it to be heavier than the Class D 3050, but it really isn't, even though it's an all-analog design. And that all-analog nature carries over to its inputs. So we've got tuner, aux, and an MM phono stage. Tuner on aux because 1978 is before the CD player, so there's no CD input on this 3030. I mean, we're talking about an amplifier that's, yeah, well over 
40 years old, like 44 years old. That's not quite as old as me, but it's older than Olaf. Now the 3050 also has an MM phono input, and it also has a single line level input. So where this reborn amplifier steps ahead of its predecessor is on digital connectivity, because it has an internal DAC. It's a Texas Instruments DAC, and that's accessible from the back panels USB, coax, Toslink, HDMI, eARC, very important, but also the Blue OS module that has been factory fitted to the MDC slot on the back of the amplifier, because this thing is upgradable with essentially upgradable cards, and the first one to go in at the factory is the Blue OS module, which gives us Blue OS streaming. So that means Rune Ready, Tidal Connect, Spotify Connect, Apple AirPlay 2, two-way Bluetooth, and then all the things all the things, all the streaming services offered by the Blue OS app. And also subwoofer integration, subwoofer crossover management, because there's a subwoofer output on the back of the 3050. What else is in the inside the Blue OS app? Oh yeah, Dirac Live. We'll come back to that later. Going back to the 3030, we note that it has a captured mains cable. So you can't swap that out if you want to. You can on the 3050, obviously, because it's got a standard IEC socket. And you'll also notice on the back of the 3030, there are no speaker binding posts, just those sprung-loaded sockets for bare wire. So I had to take my speaker cable, remove the banana plugs from the ends, the amplifier ends, so that I could hook this amplifier up, the 3030, to a pair of monitor audio speakers and a pair of PSB speakers. And in doing that connection and looking at the wood veneer on the 3030 on the vintage amp, I really did think, and still do think, that the wood veneer looks nicer on the older amp. It's wood veneer on top of plywood. And the 3050's veneer has been designed as a direct match for the veneer used on the PSB Passive 50, which you see behind me. And it's not just the veneer. I think the 3030's sort of narrower, taller dimensions make it look, I guess they're the more interesting piece. To me, it's more visually satisfying with those dimensions. And in some areas, I also prefer the feel of the vintage amplifier. It's knobs and it switches. Yeah, knob feel. Because for some reason, the source selector switches on the 3050, the new one, they wobble a little bit. I don't know why, there might be a reason for this. However, when playing music through the 3030 and looking at the VU meters, because the VU meters are the star of the visual show here, I think, the VU meters don't move all that much. We have to crank the volume a little bit, maybe to a level that's probably too loud for me, to get them to really move. And to do that, we have to get out of our chair like an animal because there's no remote control with the vintage 3030, obviously. And there is with the new 3050, and I have it here. And I gotta say, it's beamed right in from 2005. There are some transport buttons on here, down here. The play and the pause don't seem to affect rune playback, but the red hot chili peppers button, it does. And the 3050 also has a switch on the back. So we can put the VU meters into line level mode. So that means they'll bounce around irrespective of what the volume control setting is on the front. Back on the 3030, I connected my Rega Planar 8 turntable to its MM phono input and found that that phono input hisses like a very hissy thing. It's like tss. No, not good enough really. So I went to an outboard phono stage I used a very affordable $99 Zen Phono from iFi, a fantastic sounding Phono stage. And it has greater clarity and better dynamics and it doesn't hiss. And the MM Phono stage inside the 3050, I think also sounds a bit plain Jane. So when I had the iFi Phono stage into seed between it 
and the Planar 8, again, I got yeah, just a bit more of a livelier sound. And if you're thinking that the MM Phono Stage's sort of plain Jane sound is because it is digitized upon entry, then I would ask you to put down your copy of the Radio Times or National Geographic, because so too is the line level analog input. And yet the phono stage, the external phono stage that iFi make sounds better than the internal phono stage inside the amp. There is a difference even though both are digitized. So what I'm saying here is that the digitization of analog signals does not erase or diminish the differences in a meaningful way between those two analog signals. So in doing side-by-side -side audible comparisons between the vintage 3030 and the newer 3050, I left the iFi Phono stage in play for my vinyl playback, and then later I introduced the Chord Mojo 2 as an analog source to the back of each amplifier, because obviously the output on the Chord Mojo 2 is analog. And I made sure that the high frequency and infrasonic filters on the 3030 were turned off. The newer 3050 to me is what I call a squeegee clean sounding amplifier. And what I mean by that is it really kind of wipes the window between us and the music. It really is that sort of, yeah, highly transparent, highly resolving sounding amplifier. And that means if we play something like Baby Bird's Fatherhood from the early to mid nineties, a lo-fi recording, it sounds extremely lo-fi. But if we play something like Steely Dan's Gaucho, the ultimate in audiophile cliche albums, and yet here we are, then that recording sounds absolutely bloody fantastic. But there's a big difference between the Steely Dan and the Baby Bird. Can we talk about Andor for a moment, the Disney Plus TV show, the latest sort of Star Wars spin-off TV show? Most of them, no, actually all of them, until Andor, have been utter shit. I know people like to defend the Mandalorian. I know people like to defend, what was it called? The Obi-Wan Kenobi show? It wasn't called that, but whatever. But Andor is absolutely bloody brilliant. It treats its audiences with respect. It's complicated, it's nuanced, it's layered, and it's a, just a great TV show. And the reason I'm mentioning it here is because the 3050 for me is a fantastic amplifier for exposing all the sort of ambient information going on inside the world of Andor, right? So with spacecrafts coming in and then kind of swooping across the soundstage and then I guess like background information when you've got a sort of a, like a town square on Ferrix, which is, Ferrix is the planet, um, full of people and you can hear people in the background. It is exceptionally detailed. I guess this is where I come to this sort of idea of it being squeegee clean. It, and this is, it, it does skirt an audiophile cliche in saying it leaves nothing but you and the music. I mean, what piffle that really is, but I guess I'm getting pretty, pretty close to that, aren't I? Now the 3030, the vintage amplifier, by contrast, resolves fewer of those finer details, even with the Chord Mojo 2 in play. And it's more of a recording quality equalizer. So there's less of a difference between the Baby Bird and the Steely Dan. And compared to the 3050, the 3030 offers a slightly thicker sound, a slightly meatier sound, with a less extended and more burnished top end. Which means when we play the second side of Bowie's Low, which was recorded not one kilometer from here, and features a whole bunch of weird ass instrumental stuff, which is just absolutely fantastic. So Fripp and Eno and Visconti we get less sort of spatial information. Everything's sort of more together and more congealed. And there's less sort of finer details resolved, less ambient information. That's from the 3030, the vintage amp. What about Daniel Avery's Ultra Truth? Also 
played back on vinyl, and then also from my TV into the Mojo 2. Now with this album, the 3050, to me, definitely sounds more hi-fi than the vintage 3030. What do I mean by that? Well, with the 3050, we get more cleanly separated layers. We get a deeper soundstage and also more specific player placement. So this sound is definitely there rather than like somewhere over in this area that I might ascribe to the 3030. And also from the 3050, we get deeper bass reach, which lends the Daniel Avery sort of club home listening crossover album a lot more sort of low end wallop. However, Kick drums on the 3050 are tighter and drier than they are on the 3030. Now here comes the surprise finding, and that is the mid-range on the 3030 has a presence and a muscularity that the 3050 cannot seem to match. It sounds more relaxed, more standoffish, more laid back than its vintage counterpart. And I can definitely see some people preferring that more intense mid-range palpability from the 3030. But if that's you, good luck getting one, because a recent search on Hi-Fi Shark returned only five results worldwide. These 3030 amplifiers are not easy to get, not anymore. Then again, some other people might prefer the 3050s, deeper detail dig, greater refinement, deeper soundstage, in spite of its more standoffish mid-range. And when I say standoffish mid-range, I mean comparative to the 3030. In isolation, you don't really notice it. Now, as well as bass and treble controls on the front panel, so turnable knobs, the 3050 has a secret weapon inside, and that comes courtesy of the blue OS card that's fitted to the MDC slot, and that is Dirac Live Room Correction Software. They call it room correction, I tend to call it room compensation, because what it does is it allows us to measure the output of the speakers in the room in which they are placed with a microphone. There is a microphone that comes in the box, but I always use my own. We use the Dirac software to analyze that measurement and then adjust the amplifier's output to compensate the speaker output according to the room. Does that make sense? We've covered this quite a few times in the past. I think my original NAD M10 video, we might have gone deeper on this, maybe. But I'm not going to go a deep dive on this one here, not at all, because it can get pretty complicated. And I've got to say, I don't think Dirac Live is super beginner friendly. I can do it myself, but I generally always call upon my friend and Dirac Live calibrator, Terry Ellis, who lives in London, for a remote support phone call to do it. And Terry also tends to, on that support call, design three or four different yeah, different sounding correction curves, so Dirac correction curves, to see which one I prefer. So I can go away and have a listen to this one, then this one, then this one, and pick a preference. And for me, Dirac Live is especially good at sorting out the room's bass problems. So it can really bring down some of the bass modes that take place in the, the, uh, the very deep bass. And that has a surprising, for many people, a surprising knock-on effect that tends to tidy up the mid-range. So with these PSB loudspeakers, with Dirac engaged, it improves the imaging on those loudspeakers significantly. And when I say significantly, I'm not talking about some kind of teeny-weeny debatable audiophile difference. I mean, most people, even my mom and dad, would pick the difference if I switch between the two on the Blue OS app. When I say between the two, I mean with Dirac off and then on again. So when watching TV, they would hear talking heads, not the band, voices, locked more firmly into the center of the image of the, the phantom center that the speakers draw out between themselves. So it isn't so much that the, 
the voices are sort of around this speaker and around this speaker. No, it's more of a sort of fully formed human being in the middle right between the loudspeakers. And when playing back music, it also means that music seems less attached to the loudspeakers. So rather than being sort of like, yeah, just coming out from the speakers here, there's more of a sort of a centralized image. And no, it doesn't compromise soundstage width or depth or height or anything like that. It just brings everything into focus. And to use another horrible reviewer cliche, it makes the loudspeakers disappear. <laughs> which doesn't mean that the speakers disappear. It just means that there seems to be less of an obvious connection between the music as it sort of hangs or floats in the room and the loudspeakers that are creating the illusion. And for me, Dirac Live is becoming as essential as HDMI Arc in a FutureFi product like the C3050LE. So basically a streaming amplifier. But the 3050 isn't perfect. The the LEDs on the front panel, so that the source selector LED and then the sort of volume indicator LEDs, the little row of them, they are retina boiling bright. They really are, aren't they Olaf, right? Now you, you can dim them with a switch apparently on the remote control here, but even then they're pretty damn bright. Now I did talk to NAD about this and they said, yes, John, you've got a pre-production model and we are going to dim those LEDs when we put this amplifier into production, which I think it already is. Now some people might say that the elephant in the room here is NAD's own C399 streaming integrated amplifier, which gives us not UCD modules, but Hypex's higher end Encore modules. That's the class D amplifier modules that drive the loudspeakers. And it also features an ESS DAC instead of Texas Instruments, or rather an ESS based circuit, because I don't want people to get hung up on the DAC chip itself, but generally people do, and they look at the ESS DAC on the spec sheet and go, that's gonna sound better. And they look at the Encore modules and go, that's gonna sound better. And maybe it will, probably it will. And the other great thing about the C399 is it too has an MDC slot for the Blue OS module to go right in there. But even though the 399 sells for the same money in Europe as this 3050, it doesn't come with that Blue OS module factory fitted. That's an extra 600 bucks. So you are really paying, yeah, an extra 600 bucks to get the same feature set as this amplifier from the C399. But you're also getting an amplifier that has no aesthetic soul whatsoever. It's a plain black box as far as I'm concerned. There are no VU meters, there's no wood veneer casing on it at all. It doesn't have, yeah, it has no visual presence really. And when you put it next to an amplifier like this, you're like, oh, that's kind of boring. Well, I think so anyway. And there are some of you I know who will sacrifice anything at the altar of sound quality. But I'm not like that, and I'm sure many other people in this audience are not. For many of us, the, the look and the feel of a piece of audio equipment is not as important as sound quality, but it's a significant factor in how we spend our money, right? In, in what amplifiers we choose to buy, but not just amps, speakers, headphones, DACs, turntables, you know, like the look and feel of stuff is really, really important. And I think the people who say, it doesn't matter how it looks or feels, it's how it sounds that counts. I think those people are in the significant minority. Now the chances are that by the time this video goes out, this C3050 LE with its wood veneer wrap will be sold out because it's a 50th anniversary edition. It's a limited edition. NAD are only making 1,972 units and 
yeah, I would imagine they're all pre-sold by now. However, NAD are making another version of this amplifier to be released early in 2023. Now it won't have the wood veneer wrap, it will be a vinyl cover. I did ask NAD for a photo and they said we don't have any yet. And I'm not quite sure what the pricing will be, but I think it's gonna be cheaper, it really has to be cheaper because it's not going to have the factory fitted Blue OS module. You'll have to buy that as an optional add-on as you do with the C399. Like I say, 600 bucks for that, or sorry, 600 euros for that. So the C3050 LE is for people who love the look of the vintage 3030, but realize the chances of scoring one are pretty low, and also realizing that it's probably going to need recapping once they buy it and also realizing that it doesn't have any digital connectivity whatsoever, and also realizing that the Vintage Amp doesn't have the significant benefits of Dirac Live room correction. So yeah, the C3050 LE is for people who want a vintage styled amp, but with all the modern smarts available to amplify designers today. So all the streaming, DA conversion, MM Phono Stage, I mean it doesn't have MC but at this price that's asking too much I think. And then yeah, Dirac Live Room Correction. There isn't a lot more you could pack into this thing if you tried, especially not for less than 2,000 US dollars or less than two and a half grand euros. So if you like this video please consider giving us a like down below. If you like my attitude to high-end audio in that looks matter hugely, and that also, I think the, the strongest message from this video that I want you to take away is that room correction software like Dirac Live matters hugely nowadays. It has a significantly positive effect on the sound quality of our loudspeakers in our room. Even though it isn't always super simple to use, there is a learning curve there. But if you can, I guess, accommodate that learning curve yourself, then please consider subscribing to this channel. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching. And no, this is not a class A. But where this new amplifier, the 3050, steps ahead of its vintage counterpart is on... But where this modern amplifier steps ahead of its vintage counterpart is, is on... And the new modern... And if you're thinking that the MA... And compared to the 3050, the 3030, no. And compared to the 3050, the 3030 is less extended. Oh God, thicker, thicker. Which means that when we play side two of Bowie's Low, so all those kind of weird ass instrumentals with Eno and Fripp and Visconti, we get not quite the expanse, no. Why am I adding shit? But then again, some other people might prefer the 3030's deeper detail dig, its deeper soundstage. No, do that again. But then again, some other people might prefer. But then again, some other people might prefer the 3050's greater resolve or better. No, why am I f deeper detail dig? But then again, some other people. Now the elephant in this European lounge room is NAD's C3999. No, no, that's not right. 999, no. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> now the elephant in this... Now the elephant in this... Blah, 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 this, this.